The company is Keza Compressors, but located in Nairobi uh, on Mombasa Road in Siokimau. I'll take you through a quick brief to the company, our product profile portfolio, ADA and KES, which is our air demand analysis and Keza energy saving systems, compressed air optimization, engineering consultation and service, and the brand Keza itself. I hope everyone can hear me loud and clear. The company Keza. Keza is a compressor manufacturer with a heritage. We just celebrated 100 years last year. It started in 1919 by Carl Keza Sr. And uh, in 1937, his son Carl Keza Jr. joined the company. And today, maintaining its family heritage, it is run by Thomas Keza. Carl Kayser Jr. was the pioneer of the first uh, compressor, which came out in the late 40s after the Second World War. And, and today it's maintained still by Thomas Kayser and his wife. The company has many innovations from 1948 all the way to 2019, got the first reciprocating screw compressors. And after that, it's always been a positive in uh, design, innovation, and patents. Every Kayser compressor has excess of 40 patents, which no other manufacturer has. This giving it is higher efficiency, higher output, and the best specific power and specific costs compared to any other compressor manufacturer. We have evolved and we've evolved very positively. This is the plant in uh, Coburg, which is approximately 35 kilometers square. Kaiser is a fully integrated uh, company with industry 4.0 standards. The picture you're seeing of Hall 10 and Hall 11 is basically where all our compressors are manufactured, all the rotary screw compressors, totally complied to industry 4.0 standards, fully automated, lack of humans, down to the machines, everything is programmed and out come the compressors in our final goods stores. We have our own R&D center, which is highly financed which helps create the patents I spoke about earlier on. We have our own unique distribution center. And at any one given day, there are between 24 to 32 containers which leave for distribution to all of our centers worldwide. We also do diesel uh, air compressors for the construction and fiber optic sector. That's our plant. And all shield metal, sheet metal work is all done in-house. Kaiser doesn't source anything from anyone. We all do it all in-house and everything is 100% made in Germany. Gera is actually a very historic site for the Kaiser family. It was after the unification of East and West Germany. It brought development to the other side of the wall and it has developed and all of our downstream equipment, all of our blowers are all manufactured in-house at the Gera site. I would love to elaborate more about the company, but we have, I think we have a bit of a time constraint. The Kaiser presence globally is as shown on the map. As you can see, all the yellow is all Kaiser. One, one minute. The areas which are gray are uh, areas which probably have uh, economic unrest or civil war, and we're not allowed to penetrate those territories. Hence, Kaiser has become a top three, top two brand globally in the comp compressed air systems. The company has evolved from 1994 with 1,670 employees to today, which is over 7,200, 7,400 employees. And uh, we're still growing, we're still adding more subsidiaries. We are an international subsidiary. There are about 173 offices in 140 countries. And uh, all we're doing is we're just growing from strength to strength. ASA is proud to have its own university. It takes an apprenticeship from the age of 17. Until date, most of the employees at uh, Kaiser are actually graduates from the Kaiser University and tend to retire from Kaiser, such is the heritage, such is the pride 
of working for a company like Kaiser. Kaiser Compressors in Kenya. We are fully owned subsidiary. We were established in 2012. We've had presence in East Africa since 2002, but since 2012, a global policy was made to open its own subsidiary here, which is to provide sales and product support for all Kaiser products in the region. We also have a, a subsidiary which opened recently about two years back in Tanzania. We've got presence in Uganda, presence in Rwanda. We've got presence in Ethiopia, though at the moment with Djibouti, we handle Djibouti from Kenya. With Kaiser, our approach to compressed air systems is very different. Normally what we do, we don't tend to be very office-based. We always start with the survey of the plant. If, so, if a client approaches us, we will always uh, request for a visit. We'll make the visit, we'll conduct a survey, we will note our points. And after that, we conduct what we call an air demand analysis. An air demand analysis, what Kaiser call it, some of some people may call it an air audit, or some may call it a supply demand audit, but we, we refer to the name an ADA, a demand analysis. This is a process which takes about 14 to 21 days based on the size of your compressors, based on your compressor room. And with that, we generate your the data from your plant. So we get to know all your profiles. We get to know your demand profile. We get to know your pressure profile. And even we get to know your, your power metering, which all helps us then run it through our in-house simulator called KESS. KESS stands for the Kaiser Energy Saving System. With KESS, it helps us now to extrapolate data which has been gathered over the 14 day period, over the 21 day period. And with that, it helps us give you optimal solutions. At Kaiser, we don't believe in giving one solution. We will give a variety of solutions. We will give you split load curve solutions. We'll give you single system solutions. And sometimes where a norm is using a single VFD to run a plant is the most efficient is actually a norm that is not always true. So do not always believe that a variable speed drive will save you money, which I will show in a case study up ahead. Once we generate the case, once we generate our solutions, we will offer you a complete package. With this complete package now includes all PNI drawings, 3D simulations of your compressor room, all CAD design, all CAD data, the, the heating ventilation system uh, which have to be designed for. And this is all done in-house using technology available only to Kaiser, using augmented reality. Once all of that is done, we provide after-sales support. And uh, due to the current situation, we're not allowed to do it this year because of COVID. We always have an annual two-day training seminar held in Nairobi for our clients and for potential clients. With Kaiser, we do an engineered solution and we have begun introducing what we call smart pipe. Smart pipe is our aluminum pipe. We're pushing for aluminum pipe because aluminum pipe tends to increase the energy efficiencies of a system between five to 7% hence giving you a lower energy cost. The traditional system of using galvanized pipes or what I refer to sometimes as corrosive piping material, because that could even include some plastics materials, tend to give you turbulent flow rate, not laminar flow in the compressed air system. But with the aluminum piping, you have smooth laminar flow rate. And the good thing with using aluminum pipings is that uh, you tend to bypass a lot of leakages, a lot of leakages which are found in the corrosive materials used in the compressed air distribution networks. The company is in the age of industry 4.0. We believe in smart engineering. We believe in using augmented reality. We believe in, believe in using simulations. We have our own master controller called Sigma Air Manager, which is predictive which uh, maintains pressure bandwidths to plus minus 0 0.2 bar, bearing in mind that a one bar increase in pressure leads to a 7% increase in your overall energy costs. With master controllers, master controllers in the age of industry 4.0, it is a necessity in keeping your plant maintenance, keeping your plant costs down, 
and it also assists with your predictive maintenance side. Once you put the three of these together, you will notice with your asset management, you actually tend to have lower operating costs. In today's world, everything is about lower operating costs. For those who are not aware of what Industry 4.0 is, Industry 4.0 is basically the fourth industrial revolution. A quick brief is the first industrial revolution actually started in the late 1700s to the early 1900s, which was the introduction of, introduction of, uh, introduction of uh, mechanical production systems using hydraulic and steam energy. Followed by this came the second industrial revolution, which was now introducing a division of labor, mass production using electricity, which further evolved into what is currently the third industrial revolution, which is the, uh, the using of electronics, IT to favor your systems and to further automate production. Now, we take it one step above to the fourth industrial revolution, which is working on the basics of cyber physical systems. Industry 4.0 is also known as the IIoT, which is the industrial internet of things. What does it mean? Industry, uh, internet, as we know, is the transmission of data or information through an IT network or through a cloud-based system. Things are sensors to collect data, softwares to process data and break down big data, like what we accumulate from ADAs, data storage to, to create a information base and uh, microprocessors to evaluate the big data which we've broken down so that it can be represented to the end user and network connectivity to exchange data. Like with the master controllers, we can monitor you anywhere in the world. Our head office in Germany can monitor you. We can monitor any other plant sitting in Kenya. What does industry 4.0 do? in a compressed air system. Use your own. I want to join my meeting. Hello? Yeah, what does Industry 4.0 mean in compressed air systems? In compressed air systems, it is the evolution of master controllers. This links multiple compressed air stations together. This assists in only giving the air required to the plant and not generating an artificial demand. You'll hear me talk a lot about what artificial demand is. I'll, I'll bring it up when I come to best practices and optimization. And this helps reduce your pressure to, like I said, plus minus 0 0.2 bar. So you're only generating air that you need. You're not generating uh, false air. You're not generating air for processes which you do not need. Today, we're living in industry 4.0 missing in participating in the industry 4.0 world might make you miss what is next, which is probably industry 5.0. We do not know what industry 5.0 is, but to get to know industry 5.0, you need to be part of industry 4.0. And that's where we at KZR are. I'll quickly skim through our product portfolio. We manufacture all sorts of air compressors. We have our master controller we're just talking about. I'll go into a little bit of detail about this right now. With a master controller, which is our Sigma Air Manager, this helps us in generating live piping and instrumentation drawings. It gives us real time of what machine is working, which machine is working. And the Sigma Air Manager is always foreseeing the future. It's always 20 to 30 seconds ahead of what's happening in the process plant. And it's always seeing what equipment to run, what equipment, which compressor to shut down, which compressor to start, keeping to that uh, delta P, the pressure bandwidth for optimization for lower energy costs. It is fully uh, the, uh, ISO 50001 certified. You will get all your energy reports from this at the touch of the screen. You will get all your kilowatt hours. You will get your costings. And these can even be emailed to you. It is totally industry 4.0 compliant. It's connected to our the Kaiser Sigma Smart Air uh, connect, connectivity, which is the Kaiser Connect. 
all our control panels, all our master controllers, all our basic controllers, we tend to have RFID interfaces. This is just as a prevention tool to allow people from messing around with the systems because they're delicate systems. And using our technology available to us, as you go grow your compressed air system, as you grow your compressed air station, we can upgrade your compressed air station live on the master controller. So it grows with you. You will then belong to the Sigma network and you will enjoy the benefits of the adaptive 3D advanced controller. This is a presentation, but it's not running at the moment. It's a little video. What I'll do is everyone who's registered, I'm sure we have your email addresses. I will send you a video link from this from my YouTube channel and you can look at it. It explains further what I've talked about with master controllers, but uh, you will have to look at this in your free time. We will share this video link with you all. To summarize uh, what a master controller does in energy savings, it digitalizes your whole compressed air system. We have apps on our phones, which we can correlate using augmented data with augmented reality and transmit that to the master controller. Like how I said, you can update it in real time and you can enjoy the benefits of this. A lot of clients were initially skeptical of investing in a master controller. They, they come at a bit of a price, but everybody who's had this with a medium range uh, air compressor, you're talking 45 kilowatts onwards, have actually enjoyed a payback from the energy savings in less than three months. We have a full range of screw compressors, starting from 2.2 kilowatt all the way to 400 kilowatts, 600 kilowatts. We have them with belt drive, direct drives. We have oil-free compressors. We have a variety of air treatment, carbon towers, desiccant dryers, refrigeration dryers, inline filters, we have our own Kaiser eco drain and we have oil water separators for the condensate so that you can discharge your condensate safely to the environment. We do blowers for wastewater treatment for conveying for conveying process systems, but that will be a topic for another day. We, we launched the magnetic turbo blower last year. It's basically you have the shaft which levitates in a magnetic field. So basically it's wear free. There's no need for service because the lubricant is actually air. It is oil free, oil free air systems and is of extremely long life. These are normally for applications which are four to six bar, but uh, this, they don't come in small sizes. You're looking at 200 kilowatt, 250 kilowatt plus. Our mobile air for construction and fiber optics we get them in a variety of sizes. We have our containerized compressed air systems. And we have our, what I call our little toys for our workshops. And all these compressors, all the product range you've seen are 100% made in our facilities in Germany. We don't outsource. We partner with a lot of companies. We partner with Siemens on our motors. We partner with Siemens on our electricals. And all case equipment come with Siemens electronics in them. I'll further go into ADA and KESS, which is now the code of this uh, webinar. ADA stands for an air demand analysis and KESS is the Kaiser energy saving systems. How does it work? Well, basically when you come to do an air demand analysis or an air audit at your site, it always starts with the survey. The survey is a plant walkthrough. Once we go to the plant walkthrough, we know what we have, we generate the data we have, we make notes of the data we want, then we carry out the ADA. We'll come back the next day, we will uh, with our data loggers, with our little tools and connect them for a period of 14 to 21 days. Once that time frame is over, we get that data we break down the big data into small data and run it into our CAS. 
once we run it into a case, we have the system to play around with multiple options to get your optimal solution. Your optimal solution will be the solution with the lowest specific costs and the highest energy savings with the lowest kilowatts, uh, kilowatt hours used per annum. With this, we also bear in mind the re reliability concept to ensure that we do not compromise on pressures, we do not compromise on plant processes. And once all of that is done, once all is presented, then we'll work on our CAD design, our PNI, our installation plans, and our 3D representations. Can the presentation be seen on the screen? Yes. Yes, it's, it's visible. When we do an ADA and a CAS, our procedure is not only to look at the compressor. We go beyond that. We look at your receiver tank. We look at your dryers. We look at your filters. We look at your air mains charging system. An air mains charging system is a unique system only by Kaiser to safeguard all your supply equipment. When I mean supply, I'm talking about your compressors. What's, what's after the, normally the receiver or the dryer is what we call the demand side. We take care of all of these factors in order to get the most accurate data for your plant. This is the little equipment we come with. We come in with our data loggers. That's our data logger, the little transducer set pressure transducers, kilowatt meters, and this is what we connect to your compressors. Before I go further, I'd like to do a quick breakdown of compressed air costs within an industry. If you look at a little graph of your maintenance costs, your capital costs, and your energy costs in your plant, your capital costs in a year, this is a breakdown for a year, is only between 10 to 15, 16%. Your maintenance cost is a fixed cost, just like your capital cost, which is your, your regular 3,000 hour service or your 6,000 hour service, or as your manuf the manufacturer recommends. And these are fixed costs. We cannot change this cost. But the one cost, which is the bulk of the cost between 70 to 80% are your energy costs. Now this is where Kaiser specializes in. We don't focus on only the compressor. We don't focus on only the dryer. We don't focus on only a downstream. We focus as a complete package to bring this energy costs as low as possible. It could be using a split system. It could be using a single system of compressors. That is where we have to use our CAS. That is where our expertise comes in. And this is what we do for our end users. Most of my calculations you're going to see up ahead I'm working on 18 shillings per kilowatt hour, which I think is the normal going rate at the moment. I'll get into a case study to help you understand how an ADA is done. This is a client in Nairobi. It's, it's one of the, the recent case studies of the year. Between then and now, we've done a, a number of them. They had a plant working requirement of 10.5 bar. So we carried out the CAS between the 21st of February to the, we carried out the ADA between the 21st of February to the 12th of March. The net pressure is 10 bar, minimum A demand five meter cube per minute, maximum A demand 18.4 meter cube per minute. I will explain this 13.4 meter cube per minute and how we generated the five meter cube per minute. So we go, we had our plant walkthrough and we saw the existing compressed air systems. So the competitor brand, they had 255 kilowatt machines rated at 10 bar with the free air delivery of 9.2 meter cube per minute. And the year of manufacture was a 2017, 2018 model. Once we conducted the ADA, we broke down the data, we generate these graphs. I'll just take some time to explain these graphs. The two colors 
depict the two different air compressors because a data logger, we put one data logger per compressor. Over here on the, on the axis, this is our flow rate and below is our time frame. We always record from midnight to midnight. So basically each graph is representation of a complete working day. Up here is the kilowatt, the total power consumption during the day. And in between is the pressure line. This helps us interpret the data of the plant. We go through every day, one by one, to look for trends, to look for discrepancies. And we always do get them. And we always end up actually going back to our client and saying, listen, what's happening here? Why is this happening here? And that's where the advantages of a CAS come out. Once we generate this, we generate our global energy report. Now with this report, gives us all our costs. We start with, we're looking at 18 shillings per kilowatt hour. The controlled mold is real simulation. And now using this data, we can extrapolate what our annual air consumption would be, which in this case is almost 4.4 million meter cube of air. We have our two machines here, 255 kilowatt machines. The total package power, because a machine states it's 55 kilowatt, doesn't mean it's actually 55 kilowatt. There are other electronics in there. You have fan motors, you have other electronics. So you look at your total package power, which comes down to 67 kilowatts. And them running both the machines came to a total package power of 134 kilowatts. When in the offload mode, they were consuming 13 kilowatts. So maximum power consumption is 133 kilowatts. Energy consumption was 704,000 kilowatt hours per annum with a total energy cost of 12.6 million shillings. This is what it was costing the client to run the compressed air systems per year. Here is now where we dig in deeper. These are the figures, case of changes. This is where we come in. From here, we will calculate the specific power. The specific power, which is your kilowatt per meter cube per minute, which is your total package power over your flow rate, is 9.53. This is the figure we focus on. This figure, you need to reduce this figure. Bring it as low as possible as you can. With this 9.53 kilowatt per meter cube per minute, the specific cost to generate one meter cube of air is two shillings and 86 cents. Specific power, specific uh, costs, even depend on the efficiencies of the compressor motor, the, the, the efficiencies of the air ends, the RPM the machines run at. So once we got this data, what we decided to do, we broke it down. This is just a summary of what I just said. We broke it down and we give multiple options. Like I'd mentioned earlier on, we don't give one solution, we give a variety of solutions. As you can see here, this is the energy cost comparison. What you see in red is the total energy cost of the existing machines, those two 55 kilowatts. So we said, okay, let us run two, two of our model CSD 125s and instantly we got down to 10 million shillings annual costs. So we, we keep playing around with different figures and different combinations using a standalone machine, using split load combinations, using at times three, a split load of three compressors connected by a master controller. And this generates us to calculate the energy cost comparisons, the energy cost savings, which are which you can see in this graph which by the, by, two, two, by the two compressors, you get a saving of 2.3 million. I'll, I'll give you the details of this up ahead, 
2.1 million, 2.8 million, up to 3 million shillings. I'll, I'll come back to my proposals, but with this particular case, by getting the demand profile, as I mentioned earlier on, sometimes we do tend to notice some discrepancies. With this client, we always notice that at a particular time in the morning, we would flat bar. The grass would always flat bar. And this trend was noticed every day. Now, this is a trend now. We will approach the end user and ask what happened. And you will not believe it. This time, every day between 3 and 6 in the morning, was a shift change and no machines are running. And this amounted to what their air leaks were. This was their losses in energy. And if you can remember in the first chart, I'd, loaded the, I'd written that uh, the minimum air requirement was five meter cube. Their total air leak was coming to five meter cube per minute, which is roughly equivalent of, of having a 30 kilowatt air compressor running throughout the day consuming energy for no use. So this is what I just spoke about. The particular compressed state demand pattern was observed almost every morning between 3.30 and 8. When we inquired, it was a shift change. However, during this time, one air compressor was operating and producing five meter cube per minute of air at 10 bar as per the demand profile. This demand profile clearly indicates that the compressed air system was feeding something, but it was actually feeding to the ambient. It was just feeding the atmosphere and uh, the, the industry was just paying for, for wastage of air. The following case of proposals were based on the revised compressed air demand of 13.4 meter cube, which I had indicated in red after eliminating leakage. The, the phase one of this project was to eliminate the leakages, which we did. So we came up with our proposals. This was our first proposal. This is the demand profile. I'll go over to the, the energy report. And here we are by running three 37 kilowatt machines. They were running two 55 kilowatt machines. By running three 37 kilowatt machines, our total package power from 134 kilowatts has come down to 113 kilowatts. Already, there's a saving. And this is total package power. By, by, by reading it from the simulator, the CAS simulator, we actually realized that the maximum power consumption would be 95 kilowatts. And straight away, the energy consumption came down to 238 kilowatt hours. And the energy costs from 12.6 million shillings has come down to 4.2 million shillings. And uh, a to with a total cost saving of 8.3 million shillings. The specific uh, power down was 9.53, has actually come down to 7.75, with the specific cost of 2.3 shillings per meter cube of air, down from 2.86. Straight away, by having a split load system, instead of having one standby system, one standalone 110 kilowatt compressor, straight away savings are there to be made. And this is documented. This is not me going to a site and just blabbering and saying, okay, look, I can save you 8 million bob a year. This is calculated, this is extrapolated data, and this is real data. So we don't stop here at Kaiser. We carry on. We generated another proposal with the with 245 kilowatts 245 kilowatts so we'll run them one machine starts then the other one will kick in on a master slave combination again total energy costs come down the maximum power consumption has come down even further and uh, the total cost again in the region of 8 million specific power went slightly higher Specific cost the same 2.34 shillings per meter cube. The third profile now was by using a single standalone variable speed drive machine. There's a lot of talk in the market 
which goes that, oh, a variable speed drive machine will come, will save you money, you'll save 25%, you'll save 30% of your energy costs. How someone comes and verbally tells you and, and tells you you'll save money without justification, I fail to understand. It begs me to differ. But here's a classic case where a variable speed drive machine doesn't save you money. It actually costs you more money than having a fixed speed drive, than having two fixed speed drives or even having three fixed speed drives in a split load, uh, split load uh, combination managed by a master controller. The total combined package power for a single variable speed drive machine, which were 90 kilowatt is 101.6 kilowatts. The maximum power has gone up from what it was from, 80, from, from, the, from 89. The energy costs have gone up from the fixed speed machine. The specific power has gone up, the specific costs have gone up, and even your savings are not as much as you would have saved from the fixed speed machines. So if, don't always believe a variable speed drive can save you money, especially when it comes to variable speed drives, which are below 22 kilowatt, below 30 kilowatt, as your payback would be in the region of four to five years and not within a year, a year and a half, as can be seen with the savings that you're generating for this end user, which has a payback of slightly less than a year. And their investment was in the region of 6 million bob for uh, 6 million shillings for a new compressed air system. Again, we don't stop there. We come out with, a, again, a 55 kilowatt and a 30 kilowatt machine, total combined package power. The savings is not as much as what we initially saw. The specific power has gone through the roof. Specific costs are higher. Total costs are higher, but it's still less than what they were initially paying. Here we do a split again, but this time we're splitting with a variable speed drive and a fixed speed drive. I've visited a lot of clients in Kenya and I've seen a lot of, lot of factories which have variable speed drive machines and fixed speed machines. And what they end up having is a very nervous compressed air room. They end up having a very agitated compressed air system which is always in cascading. It's always fighting each other. It's either it's on a con constant load unload cycle because they get a very, very simple fact wrong when it comes to sizing variable speed drives. Sizing a variable speed drive, you have to take into consideration something called a regulation gap or a control gap. Some people call it regulation gap, others call it a control gap. And you will not believe it as far as I know in Kenya, to all the industries I've been through in my territory, where I've seen variable speed drive machines, where I've seen fixed speed drive machines, regulation gap is always there. Regulation gap will make your system fight. You will always go into a load unload cycle. Going into a load unload cycle, you're putting significant forces into your system and you're actually shortening the life of your machines. An air compressor, has to run flat out. That is when it is at its lowest operational energies, when it's running flat out. When it's on a load offload, you are consuming power in the idle mode. There should be no idle mode. There should be an off mode. It runs flat out. It's reach capacity. Machine switches off. It should not run in idle. If you want to attain optimal, optimal energy savings, so here we took into regulation gap, we sized the systems accordingly with a fixed speed machine, with a fixed speed and a variable speed drive machine. Total package power is 100, and 100 uh, kilowatt. Total energy costs, four, almost 4.2 million shillings. Total energy savings, 8.4 million shillings. Specific power is down, down to 7.57 from 9.53, almost a drop of two. Uh, two kilowatt per meter cube per, per minute. The specific costs are two shilling 27 cents. And this tends out to be the most energy efficient system now. Having uh, the, the fixed speed at the variable speed drive where the variable speed drive always starts first, takes the load, the fixed speed machine will kick in after that. Then the variable speed drive machine goes into a trim mode setting. 
this is the existing system. We fixed up their leaks. We fixed it, did the correct pipe sizing, did quite a bit of re-engineering on the air distribution network. And just without using our machines, we managed to save them 7.4 million shillings just by using correct engineering, correct, correct consultation, and using basic thermodynamic laws in compressed air flow. Though their total energy cost was still high at almost 5.2 million shillings, the specific power was high and the specific costs were still high. Once we generate all our graphs, we present these graphs to our end user. I'm just going through this quickly because of time. Yeah, we generate our recommendations. Even though the compressed air piping looks good, it looks well designed, it had leakages, we needed immediate attention. We give them our recommendations of what air treatment to be installed, how to install the air treatment, and to opt for aluminum piping. Aluminum piping is actually the best way to go when it comes to energy savings because it actually saves you a further five to, to 12, five to 8 percent of your total energy costs. So the project solution, plug the RS, do the aluminum piping. They went in the aluminum piping direction. They ended up saving more than that 8.4 million shillings as per the last ADA we conducted. And when it comes to aluminum piping, we use our own in-house software. We calculate the flow rates. We input all the bends, the straights, the T's, the drops, the size of the drops. And actually the system generates for us the optimal pipe sizing to have the lowest pressure drop of 0 0.2, 0 0.1 bar from supply to the demand to the point of use. And the biggest advantage of aluminum pipes, they come with a, a 10 year warranty and a non-corrosive like MS, galvanized, or even some plastic pipes, which we tend to see in a lot of factories, which are, which are good in the short term, but uh, long term can burst. And when they burst, it can be a bit catastrophic. So we presented the system, we presented uh, our option. This is what we do at Kaiser when we come for our plant walkthroughs. And uh, the client will decide what to go for based on our recommendations. And our client actually chose for the, the fixed speed and the variable speed drive option. Other than energy savings from the ADA, which we conduct from the air audit, we, do, we conduct and running the CAS systems, we also do heat recovery. Heat recovery is very, very, very important in compressed air systems and should be used where applicable. It can be used for, for central heating purposes, like in European countries for heating up office, or office blocks for a drying process, for creating air locks, for preheating of burner air in boilers, indoor warming, galvanizing, he central heating systems, as I mentioned, for heating swimming pools, for your showers, service water for cleaning, or in cafeterias, canteens, or in uh, food process industries. With compressed air, almost 86% of the waste energy is actually heat. And if we can trap this heat, it is free energy. And there's a case study coming up, coming up ahead of uh, one of our clients we did to generate the energy saving we conducted for them just by installing a heat recovery system. The payback, again, by, by little bit of expense was less than six months and they are saving for the rest of their, their life as long as they're operating the same boiler systems. This is how the heat recovery system works. Basically, you've got your internals of the, the, the screw compressor. We'll have your heat exchanger. It varies on the size of the, of the compressor. It could be a plate heat exchanger, it could be a tube heat exchanger. And again, depending on the application, we will size you up for what you need. Will you get the hot air from the compressed air fluids? We get transmitted to cold water, which heats the water up and it goes into a hot water tank or a calorifier for process use. This is a case study which we had conducted for a client in Nairobi to the pharmaceutical company. It was based on a screw compressor. We had given them the CSDX165, which is a, a 90 kilowatt air compressor. 
from the 90 kilowatt air compressor, the reusable energy was 76.55 kilowatt. That is the energy which we could uh, recover from the 90 kilowatt air compressor. And using the simple calorimetric uh, calculation, Q is equal to MC delta T. Q was the recoverable energy. The, the specific heat of water is all well known. The delta T was 45 degree Kelvin. One kilowatt is 3,600 kilojoule per hour. So this gives us the amount of usable water per hour, which is 1,460 or 1 1.46 meter cube per hour of hot water at 70 degree. This we had calculated heating the water from 25 degree to 70 degree, but you can get the water at 45 degree or 50 degree. The lower the temperature, you want your hot water, the higher this flow rate will be. So to calculate the energy saving on IDO, because this was the water we were going to use and put back in the condensate tank, which was to go back into their boilers. And using the formula uses usable energy times load times time IDO price over the heating value of oil and the heating efficiency, we actually generated by inputting the figures we generated a saving of 5.1 million shillings annually just from heat recovery, which, you know, which, which cost a heat recovery unit, which cost less than a million shillings. These figures here is not make believe figures. These are actual figures. This is, this is not a figure that has just erupted from anywhere. These are actual calculated figures and it's an actual saving. So all you guys who have factories, who have industries, who are using boilers, who have screw compressors, and now into your energy and into your energy management, look into heat recovery. And to summarize what I just said, by installing heat recovery systems, you can generate 1,460 liters per hour of hot water at 70 degrees C. The saving actually comes by heating the water from 70 degrees C to boiling point, which uses less IDO on the burner side. And uh, your annual saving of 5 million shillings. This is the second most important chapter now, compressed air optimization. This is a very critical topic when it comes to compressed air systems. And I'd like to divulge a little bit of time on this. And this is what uh, I also call best practices in compressed air systems. So basically, when it comes to best practices and compressed air systems, there's a lot of information out on the web, out in uh, booklets, out in pamphlets, which pretty much uh, lets you know about all the key aspects of a compressed air system. And when it comes to compressed air systems, I'm sure you've all come across these words before assessment, audit, demand, storage, leaks, artificial demand, walkthrough, dirty 30, efficiencies. As compressed air specialists, when we come to your plant, we're really not interested in knowing or using these big words or using three letter acronyms. And we really don't care what people call it. People may call it an assessment, people may call it an audit. What we want to know is what is the story on the ground? What is your compressed air? system like what is your compressed air station like we want to know the facts and figures of what's happening on your plant and to know this it doesn't start in the office i believe nobody sitting in an office can guide anyone in a plant guide anyone in a manufacturing unit on how to save energy without actually visiting them and how you, you start to a new compressed and efficient compressed air system starts? It starts with a plant walkthrough. The plant walkthrough normally starts from the compressor room and eventually involves going down through your whole pipe work and your compressed air network down to your point of view systems. This walkthrough is very critical and a lot of, lot of questions are going to be asked by the assessor, asked by myself, or asked by anybody who does this. But it's always handy if you're planning to have such a walkthrough, if you're planning to have such an assessor come through your plant, make sure there's someone knowledgeable 
who can always guide the assessor correctly because the answers given to the assessor is what the assessor is going to make his decisions, going to make his own uh, final uh, summary, final notes on. And a lot of the times you're going to keep hearing these questions popping up, pressure, flow rates, air quality, pipe size. These are standard terms we always use in a pipe, uh, in a uh, plant walkthrough. Another question which assessors use a lot and it tends to test the patience of the, the plant staff is the why. We ask a lot of whys. And why we ask a lot of whys, we need to know what is happening on the ground. When it comes to optimization, we always look at the supply versus the demand cycle. We look at the piping, we look at the leaks, we look at inappropriate uses. Look, we look at the tools and methods for analyzing. One of the tools we've already seen, which is the ADA and CAS. Yeah, we look at the case studies, we learn from case studies. And, and where we can, we always tend to give a few tips. When it comes to supply and demand, there's always a separation between the two. Because one can say, whatever goes in on one side of a pipe needs to come out from the other side of the pipe. And this is where we ask, do we really need this kind of a separation? What we are really interested in is what is happening in real time from what's going in from one side and what's coming out from the other side. Basically, it's what happens to the compressed air from being compressed on the supply side and as it travels right to the end point of fuse. That is what we're interested in. That is where your energy will be saved. A very simple example of uh, supply and demand is like when you look at your marketplace. When there's a shortage in supply, you will certainly suffer from the, the demand side. There's always going to be a consequence on the demand side because the demand will not be able to cope if there's a shortage on supply. And in this case, the supply is from the compressors and the compressed air station or vice versa. If there is an abundance on the supply side, there will be waste on the demand side as there'll be a lot of air freely available. People will tend to use it and people will tend to use it inappropriately. And here we're also generating artificial demand. So what we need to do as we study this, as we study the supply demand cycle, is we need to find an equilibrium, which is going to be your energy efficient compressed air system, your energy efficient compressed air network. When I say compressed air network, I am talking about what people normally refer to as a ring main system in your plants. Where to optimize? Basically, when it comes to optimization, there are three main areas. You have your compressor room. This is your compressor, your receiver, your dryer, your inline filters, your air, air oil separations. And then you have your distribution network, which is your ring main system. And after that, you have eventually your point of view systems. And one thing about when you look at these three key areas, there's always always room for improvement as from experience as from a lot of plant walkthroughs i've conducted what the actual design was meant to be and what is currently on the shop floor are two different scenarios today because there have been expansion plans maybe whoever did the actual design undersized the piping so we're always there to improve we're always there to help improve efficiency it is a continuous process. It's not that because we come today, that is the end of us for the rest of the manufacturing life. No, no, no. It is always growing. It's always continuous. When it comes to wastage, this is what I like to call the big three. You have your leaks, you have your artificial demand, and you have your inappropriate uses. The leaks, self-explanatory, 
cover for about 25 to 30 percent of your total air losses. Artificial demand is between 10 to 15 percent, and inappropriate uses is 5 to 10 percent. Artificial demand is basically when the operating pressure is higher than normal than what the required pressure is. And so then all the tools, all your end equipment, you may be using power tools, you may be using specific equipment, tend to use more air than is actually required. And this leads to, if there are leaks, leaks leaking more, which again is a huge cost to your plant. And this artificial demand, we have to try and narrow it down to as low as possible, as possible. Inappropriate uses, this is, which is very common in nearly every industry I've visited. People having an air shower, dusting themselves using compressed air, cleaning their work air stations, yeah, using it to sweep the floors, using it to, to blow dust away from their, their workplaces. Again, this compressed air is not free. This compressed air costs you money. This is air you need to stop. This is a practice you need to stop. This 10% which is being used is actually a very big saving when you extrapolate it to over a year. Instead of using compressed air, if you need to blow, get a leaf blower, get a simple blower, use a fan. But this is a habit that needs to be stopped immediately in all practices. And again, there are a lot of health hazards which come with the uh, air showers. There have been recorded deaths of people dying having an air shower because the compressed air has gone in through a cut into the body system and an air bubble has caused them to have a seizure. So it's a totally not a good practice. Waste, components of waste is basically your wastage of energy. It's basically just you're just giving away your money to the ambient, giving away money to the atmosphere, which you, money which can be saved. When it comes to the leak, you have a lot of unregulated uses. This is basically machines using higher operating pressure than regulate that needed, running a system at 10 bar when you need 7.5 bar. And uh, sometimes they could be regulated, sometimes they can be unregulated or a mix, it is about containing these. And if, and, and if need be, sometimes it's better to have a separate line. There's some installations we have done where we've had two uh, compressed air distribution networks, one high pressure network running at 10 bar and one low pressure network running at 7.5 bar. And this again, helped that industry save a lot of money from the compressor generating only 7.5 bar, then generating 10, 10 bar because there's a rule of the thumb, which you all have to bear in mind. A one bar increase in pressure generation is a 7% increase in your total energy costs. So for saving 2.5 bar in energy generation from your compressors actually gives you a humongous, it gives you a significant energy saving on your total compressed air costs annually or monthly or how you calculate it in your plants. Another thing which comes under these leaks and artificial demand, but they, they tend to overlap, is when there are multiple compressors in a manufacturing unit. And these multiple compressors are not sequenced. As in they are, <clears throat> they're working on a load offload cycle, they're working on the same load cycle Excuse me. And uh, they're basically fighting each other. Excuse me, give me a quite a bit of a cough. <coughs> now, these, if you have these systems generating a nervous compressed air system in your plant, two compressors which are in cascade effect, two compressors um, loading at the same time. You need to find a way, you need to get a master controller and get this sequenced to help you save further on your compressed air savings, on your compressed air energy systems. With artificial demand, the most common practice is overpressuring, 
Why do people tend to overpressure is to compensate. They do not realize what they're compensating for. When it comes to compensating, people, are, people tend to get their whole piping system wrong. People tend to get their compressed air distribution wrong. People tend to get their design wrong. So to compensate at the end point, they run at a higher pressure. When all they need to do is just get a survey done, get everything properly sized, and you'll likely be surprised what you may think is an expense by re-engineering your plant is actually an investment because the savings which will be generated will actually make you even pay buy more machines, will make you expand on your compressed air machinery. Inappropriate uses, like I told you before, using for personal cooling, sweeping, showering, air knives. A very common thing I tend to see when I come to compressed air systems, when I come to plant walkthroughs and, and compressed air systems, is uh, flexible hoses. I'm not a big fan of having flexible hoses due to the, the fact that they're a big cause of uh, pressure losses in a, in a compressed air system, a very big pressure loss always generates from compressed air hoses. And with compressed air hoses, you sometimes don't tend to notice the leak or you tend to ignore those leaks. Another fact is uh, a quarter inch opening leaking at seven bar and say it's operating 24 hours a day comes to approximately an annual energy cost of 2 million shillings per annum. That 2 million shillings is like running an 18 kilowatt compressor full time, 24 hours, 365 days a year. When a new 18 kilowatt machine costs way less than 2 million shillings on lost energy costs. Always focus on the leaks. And my bit of advice to you all is start with your big leaks and then move down to the smaller leaks. The big leaks will likely be costing you more money. Focus on those, then come down to the small leaks. Sometimes when it comes to leaks, there may be leaks where uh, you may not be able to see, may not be able to be felt, or may not be able to be heard. You may need to get in a professional auditor to come in with ultrasonic tools, ultrasonic equipment to conduct that for you, or you myself uh, with the proper prior training can procure the equipment and do it in-house if you have an energy team working in your plant. Air tagging. <clears throat> Air tagging sometimes becomes a joke to me. It's a very, very good practice as long as action is taken. I've been to industries where uh, we did an air audit, did the air tagging. As a courtesy visit, about six, seven weeks later, I visited the same plant again just to see the tags the way I left them. Please note, just by tagging an air leak doesn't mean you have fixed the air leak. Take action, it's costing you money. I'll come back to a case study again with the, when I'm referring to air leaks. This is the demand profile for a certain client of ours and it was data accumulated over an 11 day period. If you look at it, the, the peak or productive demand is in the region of 8,000, 8,200 CFM running on the productive days. And when we were, when we kept the data loggers uh, logged in for the non-productive days and off peak and off day shifts, we were noticing that they had an air leak in the region of 3,200 to sometimes slightly more than that. Now this client thought he was running efficiently, but what he did not realize is air leaks were actually 40% of his peak air demand. And how we came to this end user is he called us and he said, listen, I want a quotation for X kilowatt air compressor. When you come to me and you tell me you want X kilowatt air compressor, I will first ask you, why do you want X kilowatt air compressor? 
and 99.9% of the of the clients have met 99.9% of the times I've dealt with people, they do not need X kilowatt air compressor. They need X minus one. They always we always tend to need either one size or two size lower air compressor than what they need. What are they trying to do? They've got increase in leaks. They've got an artificial demand generated. So they think I need another air compressor. So let me buy a new air compressor. Let me add more pressure. A general norm is in the, within the Kenyan markets I've noticed if something doesn't work, the line is boss, I just need more pressure. Sometimes you don't need more pressure. Go to your plant, fix your leaks. You might even have extra pressure. You might even have a demand more than you require. So we worked on this client and we actually, what he came and told us and what we supplied him was, was, was the compressor smaller than what he wanted. And we at KZ always do that. We will always come visit you, guide you, advise you and take you through that. And why we do it? Because when you have such leaks, number one, like how we came wanting to buy a new machine, you're increasing your capital costs. You do not want to do that, especially at the moment. Times are tight. We are going through a great period at the moment, not only in Kenya, but throughout the world, you need to hold on to your capital costs. By having machines running all the time, nonstop, you're only increasing your own maintenance costs, which can be minimalized. And the biggest culprit of all will be your energy cost. Your energy cost is going to skyrocket. So like I said, always pay attention to your leaks. Piping. Piping is, again, a very, very, very critical part when it comes to compressed air system. This now forms your demand cycle of the compressed air network, the compressed air system. And when it comes to piping, one thing I always pay very, very close attention to is the material of the piping used. Technology has evolved, materials have evolved, and I'm always up for changing, going into the modern way of using aluminum piping. It's non-corrosive. It will go a long way in reducing your leakages. And with aluminum piping and with their fittings, you tend to have very, very, very minimal, if literally no leakages. If you're using a corrosive piping material, always keep an eye on it because leaks will form. Leaks will form, it will generate you energy losses. Corrosive piping materials, like if you're using MS or GI gas galvanized, as they corrode internally, because you've got pure uh, downstream equipment, you'll have a lot of condensate generation. What you're doing is you're actually restricting your inner diameter of the pipe. By restricting the inner diameter of the pipe, you're compromising already your airflow. By compromising your airflow, you're doing what? You're generating, the first thing, a massive pressure drop. Generating a massive pressure drop means what? You're getting from the supply side, your air compressor, to work that little bit harder. You are not generating a 10 bar, when maybe you only need 5.8 bar at the point of use. What are we doing again? We're wasting energy. We're wasting our money. But that's why I said, always be critical on your piping. One way I like how to look at piping, I always look at piping like it's an infrastructure. I'll give you a very good example of this. When you're sitting in traffic, you're sitting in traffic, you're getting frustrated, there you are, you're blaming the, the traffic lights or they're taking too long, this is a bad design of a road. Why is it taking so long? You're getting frustrated, you're getting irritated, and you're blaming the design. But on the opposite side, if you're on a, on a free-flowing road, you're cruising, you're thinking to yourself, wow, this is a very good design. Whoever designed this road system has done a very good job. Piping is like that kind of infrastructure. When we do piping, we have to keep it as simple, as straight, and without resistance. And when you have your correctly designed piping and you have your compressed air, move, your compressed air moving through it, 
we need to step in again because here compressed air is going to flow through the piping what we need to do we need to think for the compressed air we need to challenge channel the compressed air to flow smoothly like that example i gave you of the road which was flowing smoothly even though that road could have been designed badly but how the concept of flow was made it very smooth flowing so the same with the piping you need to make the design perfect you need to size the, the design properly and by doing that automatically your pressure drops and your velocities will become optimum you don't want too much velocity in your pipe and you don't want too little velocity also in your pipe when it comes to air quality air quality matters because uh, if you have wet air some some industries do not need a do not need a dry do not need dry compressed air for the applications air quality needs to be monitored especially if you're using cor corrosive uh, materials for your piping the connections you're using do not narrow down pipes keep the pipes at the right sizing narrowing down pipes is going to lead to again your pressure drops is going to lead in restrictions of the compressed air systems same with your isolation lines your flexibility and material selection isolation lines i'm talking about when you have your point of use you have a one line going down which could be a flexible hose which is a very big enemy of mine when i see it in fact in factories because it's a very big generation of uh, compressed air losses you need to consider that and design it properly when it comes to compressor room piping we always focus on mini minimizing the pressure drops minimizing the velocities avoiding the water pocket sizing for the future condensate removal and pipe supports pipe supports are critical because people take it for granted the amount of significant forces when a machine goes into load offload cycle and if these forces keep creating vibrations it can actually end up causing a catastrophic failure in the pipe and it can actually end up hurting people so always support the pipe correctly distribution and point of use piping like i said avoid restrictions always consider the end use and when you consider the end use you will automatically minimize your pressure drops storage supply and demand side this question pops up regularly to me you're like do i need more compressors in my plant or is my compressor is my receiver do i need more air receivers in my plant or is my air receiver my compressed air station uh, satisfactory again it depends on plant to plant what works for one plant may not work for your plant like if you look at number 1 is a wet tank I'll just get my pointer number one is a wet tank then you have a dry tank and you have supplementary uh, stabilizer tanks or accumulators as I, I refer to them as accumulators or some people can call them a pressure buffer again it varies from uh, plant to plant and by doing that by having secondary air receiver tanks it can actually help in some end using processes which improve the speed and thrust or torque for certain applications it could be for a, a, a pneumatic uh, press. It can protect critical users from pressure changes. When you have metering, it can protect users from a high demand. And also, when you have a, an air receiver tank in your compressor room storage, and unlike having secondary receivers in the plant, it actually helps in avoiding short cycling. Short cycling is that load, unload, load, unload which is uncontrolled, yeah, which is like an, an agitated uh, compressed air room. Air quality improvement, everyone knows about that. And again, provide a buffer and help to reduce peak electrical demand. Pressure losses within a compressed air system. Every station you pass through from your compressor to your receiver, to the dryer, to the filters, right down to the endpoints of use and distribution network you will have pressure losses size it correctly work on it get professionals like us in we can simulate your plant we can re-engineer your plant we can calculate the correct pipe sizing for you so that you're running at only what you need to generate you're only paying for the air you need and as i heard earlier on compressed air is not free like the gentleman said 
goals of an assessment. We've covered quite a bit of this already. To evaluate uh, system design, measure power and flow demand profiles, analyze respond to demand, determine the pressure profile so that you can set your machines accordingly. The leak rate, as we saw in my case study, storage and controls. Do we need to have secondary tanks in the air compress in the manufacturing unit or not? Again, my enemy inappropriate uses. What kind of air treatment selection is needed? This, I would like to take a few minutes to divulge on this because a lot of people get it wrong. A lot of people get this totally, totally, totally wrong, especially when it comes to air dryer selection. An air dryer is not an apple to apple to your flow rate of your air compressor. If you're getting five meter cube from your air compressor, you do not mean that you need a five meter cube air dryer. Manufacturers come with the table, manufacturers come with correction factors, manufacturers come with the correction factors relative to your ambient, ambient temperatures, relative to your ambient input uh, compressed air temperature to your dryer, to your humidities, use these. Everywhere I've gone, I've seen undersized dryers. Undersized dryers, again, what you're doing, you're messing up the quality of your air. You're generating pressure drops. It's costing you money and it's shortening the life of your air dryer. If you need more, contact me. I will guide you on air dryer selection. I will guide you on online filters selection. I always see this wrong when I go to plants and I see other people have done installations. And you always have to continuously work to improve your specific power. Specific power, how I spoke to it in my case studies earlier on in the ADA. Work on that. Try to bring it as low as possible. Your specific cost will come down. Your savings will only get better. Typical findings from my experiences I've seen through all my plant walkthroughs. Artificial demand, pressure settings are very high. Crazy amount of leaks. One thing, make it, I'll make it clear, you cannot eliminate all the leaks. You will have process leaks. You will have machine leaks. But bulk of the leaks, 90% of the leaks, 80% of the leaks, we can bunk them up. You will save on energy. Malfunctioning of compressed air equipment. This is like how I just spoke about your downstream equipment. People don't take care of their filter elements, do not replace inline filter elements on time. The dryers are undersized, creating strain. A poor selection of application of compressor controls, not sequencing the machines correctly, yeah, having them run in uh, on-off or fighting them on the pressure settings together in an on-off continuous on-off cycle. Inadequate piping, especially at POU, which is point of use. Get the pipe sizing done correctly. You need a professional. Bring the professional in. Let him do the homework for you, and it's only you to gain. Nobody else. Again, poor selection of application of filters, dryers, connectors, regulators. People get this wrong. People get connections, uh, connectors wrong. People get the, what kind of unions to use when they're using corrosive GI piping wrong. Get the professionals in. These are my typical findings. This is where I always go and I see in plants and to make you alert of what my findings are. Improper sizing is my favorite friend when I go for my plant walkthroughs always working on re-engineering, always working for the future. Improper use of uh, compressed air and uh, the need for air saving devices. A lot of technological companies have come out now with specific nozzles, like when it comes to uh, cooling of bearings, when it comes to replace air knives in the manufacture of armored cables and all. Invest in those, it'll, it'll, you will get your money back in your savings. The key takeaways, compressed air energy is a significant investment, as we all know. And this uh, investment is included of capital, energy, and maintenance. In today's world, we need to try and keep our costs as low as possible. Multiple compressor systems, if not controlled, will cost you a lot of money on your power. They need to be properly in controlled. Invest in a master controller. Speak to the guys. If you want us to visit, we'll visit, get a master controller, work at only your operating pressures, and you will have significant, significant energy savings by the end of the year. Compressed air demand and pressure profile data, 
will help identify areas of improvement. You can always know where from the charts something could be wrong because it is on a timeline. You can tell from the, you can speak to the production manager that between seven in the evening and nine in the evening, why was there a spike? What was this happening? You will realize maybe somebody is having an air shower. There's a process in use. You can identify problematic areas. And it's always worth investing in a perm permanent monitoring system compliant to the ISO 50001. So you can always have your energy reports, constant monitoring your energy reports. If you see a variance happening, you know something is wrong, you can take action. Like I said, auditing the air system, this, if you have master controllers, this will do it for you themselves. Creating a balanced system, creating a system in equilibrium. And the inappropriate uses, my friend is still there. Yeah. Implementation, what internally as a team you guys can do as a manufacturing unit, generate a leak management team, correct, correctly get the distribution point sized up. You can do it in-house, you can get it outsourced. It depends on your internal uh, decision making. And uh, always work on an improved air quality. Inappropriate uses, air shower. Air shower can be replaced by using a fan or air cleaning. As a summary, <clears throat> always have stable air pressure, higher pressure, higher demand, higher leaks, higher the cost, control unregulated, and like I said, operate at lowest possible pressures, remove restrictions, evaluate the system, and evaluate continuously. Action plans, like I've already spoken about that, monitoring equipment, training, leak detection, eliminate improper use. Engineering and consultation at Kaza, what we do, we have access to all sorts of tools to give you 3D simulations, to give you 3D drawings, PNI drawings. We'll even generate for you uh, how your hot air flows. The simulator is not working today, but I will share the links on your email on how even we generate the hot air and the heating, when then the ventilation systems in a compressed air room, we can simulate that using the augmented reality and the software systems we have at hand. Containerized systems. Service, we have a very, very strong service department. All space are readily available. We back you up. We thrive on our aftermarket and uh, we never let the clients down. Training courses and seminars, like I mentioned early, earlier, we do it annually. And because of the COVID this year, everything has been put on hold. But uh, I think with the collaboration with Innovators and Chris, uh, I'll try and work something out so that we can do a two day compressed air training seminar, which covers all nine major chapters of compressed air. Last year was 100 years, spoke about it, a few of the pictures of our socials. We are very strong on social media. You can follow us on our websites. You can, it can take you to our USA website, our British website, our Singapore, Malaysia, Mexico, Argentina website. Like I said, we've got very strong representation in 140 countries. We're strong on Facebook, YouTube. Uh, this year, our trade fairs have all stopped, but if you look at the amount of trade fairs compared to the months in a year, at any one particular time, we are somewhere present at some trade fair. We've got a lot of clientele. Within eight years, we've got excess of uh, 600 machines now in the territory which since 2012. People are realizing case is a good machine. Just as a small showcase with the German Chamber of Commerce on energy, uh, there was a panel between uh, regulatory authorities, engineers, and businessmen. Case of compressors took part in it. We were put up against Eberle, Aquinas, BASF, and Man Diesel. And we actually got awarded by the German Chamber of Commerce for the energy savings we conducted in a local oil refinery. And uh, this is the award given to us. That's our MD holding the plaque. And basically what it was, the total energy cost per year during initial measurement, this is after an ADA, when we did the ADA, was 26.1 million. We gave them the proposals, we worked on them, they went through our proposals, the total energy cost per year after implementation of the proposal came down to 15 million shillings, 
with a gen with an overall savings of 10.4 million 10.2 million shillings this was conducted two years back this is what kaiser does this is just one of many examples I, I showcased a different case study with the 8 million shilling savings. We've got excess of 17, 18 other clients with excess with savings of excess of 5 to 6 million shillings. Smaller machines will generate smaller savings, but you definitely get your payback within a year. And we can still generate a further savings. It's an ongoing process with them. We haven't stopped working with this local oil refinery. And uh, that's what KZ does. Additional resources are available. We have our talk shop at uh, kazertalkshop.com. You can go to our website, kazer.com. We have a lot of white papers available for you to download at kazer.com slash white papers. We have our online toolbox, which you can get from our website. And for people in Kenya, if you need to contact us, my email address is sales.kenya at kazer.com. You can contact me on the number below on plus two five four twenty twenty six twenty two fifty three five i'll repeat two five four two zero two six two two five three five and with that i'd like to say thank you for your time i hope there was something to gain out of my talk and my yapping today and would be great if you could end up choosing case as your partner for compressed air fuelers for compressed air systems 